Amen. Would you take your Bibles, open them to the book of 2 Kings chapter 25. <clears throat> We're going to look at the last paragraph in 2 Kings chapter 25 in a Bible study that I've entitled, The Freedom That Forgiveness Gives. The freedom that forgiveness gives. And I forgot to mention, but this is a part of a series that deals with our past. And so if you go to our app, uh, if you download our app on any platform, right on the home page is a series that I taught called Free From Our Past. And that's almost always the issue of forgiveness and unforgiveness is rooted in our past. It's a past happening that we actually carry into today and it ruins today. And so today I know the Lord wants to give us freedom because as you look around, it's not hard to see that there's a desperate need for forgiveness today. A desperate need. Families are broken. Marriages are dissolving. Painful circumstances have happened. Separations, divisions, it's hard. And the influence of the devil to hold on to resentment, anger, bitterness, and an unforgiving spirit continues to weaken the church divide the family, and erode the effectiveness of our lives in Christ. The problem is, is that we willingly participate and cooperate with the plans of the enemy, holding unforgiveness. More damage, more pain, more ongoing separation is rooted in the sin of unforgiveness. And I use that word not lightly. Unforgiveness is a sin for the believer. Considering all that we've been forgiven, who are we to withhold forgiveness from another? Early on, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. I'll read it to you from the New Living Translation. It says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. And you go, yes, amen, yes. However, in verse 15, if you refuse, listen, if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. If you're taking notes, jot these down. Forgiveness of others is non-negotiable. I want to lay the foundation before we get into the text. Forgiveness of others is non-negotiable. Number one, forgiveness is commanded by God and obedience is not optional. In Mark chapter 11, verse 25, it says, when you are praying, First, and this is, this is amazing to me, again, reading from the New Living, from the text, we'll get into the New King James, but here, from the New Living, listen, the, the phrase is startling. When you read it, it's startling. Jesus says this, Mark eleven twenty five. when you're praying, first forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against. Imagine that. In this, among the saints here today, among us, there may be those of us holding a grudge against another person. Jesus says, in the area of your attitude and your heart of holding a grudge, first forgive them. First forgive them when you're praying so your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. It's non-negotiable. Number two, when you forgive, forgiveness reflects the image of Jesus Christ. There is one of the greatest aspects of our Savior and that is he forgives those that call upon his name. He forgives. Remember, in his final words like Jesus is is literally moments away from death he has been brutally tortured and beaten he's carried the cross beam of the cross on his shoulders as he's walked to the place of Golgotha he has been violently placed upon the cross a Roman torture device and he's hanging there in the last moments of his life choosing his last words very very carefully And in his final words, they're hanging between two criminals and all those that are watching. He's he's there not of anything that he's ever done. He's sinless. Some of his final words, you guys know them. Father, same with me. Father, forgive them. Some of his final words. One of the last examples he leaves is forgiveness. It reflects the image. Number three, when you forgive, forgiveness breaks down strongholds in our lives. Forgiveness breaks down strongholds. When you and I forgive, we experience healing to our hurting hearts. And forgiveness is, I have it in my notes, one major, but I've changed my mind on it. It's not one major antidote. Forgiveness is the antidote. 
to the bitterness that you carry in your life. You know, sometimes people, they walk around with bitterness and anger and you can just see it. It's on their countenance. It's in their, it's the way they talk and it's the way they walk. I heard it said this way, bitterness is like bad breath. Everyone knows you have it, but you. And the way to get outside of bitterness, you know, because you're like, hey, bro, I think you're, you know, dealing with bitterness. And I'm not dealing with bitterness. And their whole answer is like so bitter and caustic. And forgiveness deals a death blow to bitterness. You think the issue is them, but the actual issue is you because you're the only one. I'm the only one that I control my decisions. Everyone else is going to do their own thing, but I get to choose how I respond to the grace and the goodness of God. And it ministers to me and it breaks strongholds in my life. The entire story of Joseph illustrates this. Just a man that lived in forgiveness. And number four, forgiveness, when we forgive, it loosens the stranglehold of guilt in the offender. When you forgive, no longer will the person have to rehearse their sin and carry it unforgiven by you any longer. They are released by your love and your kindness and therefore forgiveness brings freedom to everyone involved. And we forgive because Christ forgave us. That's the model. That's the, pa- that's the pattern. That, that is what we look to because of the forgiveness of God. If Jesus, imagine where you and I would be if Jesus did not extend the kindness and forgiveness to you and me as rank, rebellious, resistant sinners. I, I know personally, had God not intervened in my life and extended and opened my eyes spiritually to his forgiveness, I most certainly wouldn't be alive today period of the life and the pattern of my life where I was headed, I would not be alive today. Neither would I be enjoying the blessings of life and the joy of interacting and even meeting you today. What a privilege and a gift it is for me to be here. It's the forgiveness of God that brought me here that sustains me. So at this point, I think it's good to pause before we jump into the text and understand forgiveness just a little bit more. Let me give you a definition. Let me give you a really simple definition. Forgiveness is releasing someone from the debt that they owe you. When you forgive, you are releasing someone from the sinful debt that they owe you. Like, like you, think, you, you think today, well, Ed, you don't understand what they did. And Ed, you don't understand what they said. And Ed, you don't understand what they posted. And Ed, you don't understand, Ed, because if you understood, then you would sit where I'm sitting and give, you would agree with me that they don't deserve forgiveness and I just won't forgive them. No, no, you you know, when you forgive, like if they didn't sin against you, if you weren't hurting so bad right now, there'd be no need for forgiveness. We wouldn't be talking about it. Forgiveness exists because of the pain you experience in life. And when you forgive, you not only acknowledge the pain and what someone did to you, but you release them. It's an accounting term. You release them, you let them go. You say, no, I don't, you don't owe me anymore. You don't have a control over my life. You don't own me anymore. Now, the problem with forgiveness is that not only do we misunderstand the definition, but we also think that forgiveness means things that it doesn't. For example, some of you are withholding forgiveness because you think this. Well, if I forgive them, then it was just acting like nothing ever happened. No, 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 no. Forgiveness doesn't act like never, nothing ever happened. Quite the opposite. Forgiveness is acknowledging all the bad happened. And you're just simply saying, hey, look, I'm not going to be bound by your sin against me. I'm not going to let you control my life. I'm not going to let your hatred, your offenses, I, I am not in any way acknowledge or ignoring the sin. I'm acknowledging the sin and releasing you from it by the grace of God. Because I know you withhold, you go, Ed, the only thing I can control really is my unforgiveness. It's like the only thing I have over that person that's hurting me is, is my forgiveness. Yeah, so let them go. Let them go. Release them. Forgiveness is not approving or ignoring the sin. It's the exact opposite. Secondly, sometimes people withhold forgiveness because they think, well, if I forgive them, then they'll just hurt me again. Well, they already are hurting you again every single day that you hold on to unforgiveness. And they're not even around. They're out living their own life, doing their own thing. 
but you wake up with them on your mind, you go to bed with them on your mind. And, and, and this is really significant, especially for those of you that have come from an abuse background where you've been abused by someone, you've been truly hurt and physically, mentally, emotionally, whatever type of abuse it might be. Forgiveness does not approve of abuse, neither does it place you in a position to be abused again. Absolutely 100% are you not to submit to physical abuse at all. But forgiveness releases you from the abuser's control over your life. Let those words sit in and sink in. Unforgiveness makes things worse, not better. And then thirdly, another confusion with forgiveness, and this is where I gave you my email address for the sake of people listening in, you can email me at ed at edtaylor.org. This is a big one. You're like, man, Ed, I've forgiven and I've forgiven and I've forgiven and it's still not worth, they don't get along with me, they're still, I've forgiven, Ed, and maybe I haven't forgiven correctly. Let me, let me clarify, this is huge. Forgiveness does not equal reconciliation. Reconciliation and forgiveness are two separate things. Forgiveness is your part and it's unilateral and required. You need to choose the forgiveness, to extend the forgiveness of God that you've received to others in your life. And you go, well, I've done that and the relationship still isn't fixed. That's why you need to understand the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. One of the pamphlets that I'll send you goes into this more in depth, but consider this. In order to be reconciled with God, a person must first what? Repent. Repentance is needed for reconciliation. So if the person never changes, there's a good chance you won't have a real relationship with them. But that does not give you permission not to forgive them and release them and move forward in the glory and the strength of the Lord. Re- reconciliation requires repentance. If the person doesn't change, the relationship changes. <laughs> and you're just unable. And it's frustrating and it's hurtful and it's difficult for sure. But when we forgive, beautiful things take place, which brings us to the text today. 2 Kings chapter 25. We have a beautiful picture of forgiveness and the power that comes when a person gives and experiences forgiveness. Now, by the time we get to the end of 2 Kings, Jerusalem has fallen and the second to the last king of Judah has been in prison for 37 years. During this time, King Nebuchadnezzar privately declares his great power and his great possessions according to Daniel chapter 4. And while the words are still in his mouth, you remember Nebuchadnezzar became like a beast and he was there for seven years. He was in that condition. During those seven years, his son, evil Merodach, came and arose to the throne for a short amount of time until Nebuchadnezzar came to his senses and then he came back put his son in prison for all the things that he did, probably met the other king in prison. Nebuchadnezzar dies. His son comes to rule again. And that's where we are here at the end of chapter 25. Check this out. Read it with me in verse 27. 2 Kings 25, verse 27. Now it came to pass in the 37th year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the 12th month of the 27th day of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, released Jehoiachin, king of Judah, from prison. He spoke kindly to him, gave him a more prominent seat than those of the kings who were with him in Babylon. And so, verse 29, Jehoiachin changed from his prison garments. He ate bread regularly before the king all the days of his life, And as for his provisions, there was a regular ration given him by the king, a portion for each day, all the days of his life. So immediately as evil Merodach comes to to the, the throne once again, the first thing it's recorded of him, at least in the life of Jehoiachin, is that he releases him from 37 years of imprisonment. Now I want you to think about that for a second. To be in prison for 37 minutes, 37 days, 37 months, 37 years. How easy it would be along the way somewhere to give up hope. And I wonder if Jehoiachin felt a little weird being free so quickly. 
just out of the blue. Uh, A call comes and he is taken out every day, all day, for one day, for two days, for a week, 50 weeks, 100 weeks, 37 years. Can I speak to that just for a second? Because his release from prison was immediate and you'll see it was complete. Immediate, 37 years, it was an immediate change. Unforgiveness is like a prison. And without asking, I'm sure, I'm, I'm a hundred, uh, I'm convinced a hundred percent, there's at least one person listening to me right now that has been imprisoned by unforgiveness far longer than they ever expected. So much so that unforgiveness has become a friend. And I've seen over the years how people just get used to their captivity. They just get used to their sinful habits. They just get used to their flesh. They're not enjoying the freedom that Jesus gives at salvation anymore. They, they've made bitterment, bitterness and resentment their good friends. Bitterness has taken root and it's defiled even people around them. And sadly, some people would rather stay in their captivity than enjoy the freedom of the Lord. And remaining in your captivity of unforgiveness is not God's will for your life. It is simply not God's will. And I want you to remember this. If this is all you leave with today, I, I want you to remember this. Unforgiveness, if you're, if you're a mathematician, you like math, unforgiveness equals being stuck. Even more so going backwards in your relationship. You're stuck. You're stuck. And, and I would even say, just because I'm only going to be here and then I'm going back home, so you can be mad at me all the way home if you want. I'll tell you this. Any type of resistance you have toward me in this teaching right now is only validation that you're stuck. God knew that I'd be here today. He knew the message would be delivered. But he's been with you and dwelling you all this time. Imagine he sent a man a thousand miles, sent another man a thousand miles. I've been here now 20 years. You've been here seven, eight years, six years. So you think of all the pieces that God arranged to put together sovereignly for this moment in time. And I have nothing against you. I understand unforgiveness. I understand what it feels like in my life. I understand what it means to be imprisoned by it. I understand what it's like for someone to come and tell me that I'm bitter, but not acknowledge it and go the hard way instead of the easy way. You know, the easy way today is just to acknowledge your sin before God and repent yourself. The easy way today is to be free from your captivity. There's a beautiful world outside of the unforgiveness that you're experiencing. Because in our text today, I want you to see the value and the beauty of forgiveness. I want you to see what it looks like, what, it, what a demonstration of it is by illustration through the life of Jehoiachin. And so I want you to observe this king of Babylon, a wicked, not even a believer in God, not even a God follower, not even a man of the covenant showing more forgiveness than most believers show to others. So pick up with me if you're taking notes. Number one, I want you to see this in Jehoiachin's life. Number one, he was brought out by the king. Come back to verse 27. It came to pass in the 37th year, in a moment of time, the captivity of Jehoiachin on the 12th month, the 27th day, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year he began to reign, released Jehoiachin. He released him from prison. The king didn't send a messenger, didn't even send a servant to release him. He chose to do it himself. And that's what God has done for us. The creator of the universe himself has come and forgiven us and set us free. That's how special you are to God. All of those rotten acts, all of those horrible words, all of the sins that have been buried, washed away, blotted out, been forgiven by Jesus. It's John chapter 8 verse 36 that says if the son sets you free, what? You'll be free indeed. That's what Jesus has done for you. He's released you. The king himself has come to release you. I love that. Number two, I want you to notice with Jehoiachin, not only was he released, but secondly, Jehoiachin in verse 28 was comforted by the king. After he was released, he was comforted. Verse 28, he spoke kindly to him. This is king prisoner, 
king prisoner. But in a moment of time, they became equals. And the king spoke kindly to him. I'm sure that 37 years of imprisonment left Jehoiachin discouraged and depressed without hope. I don't know for you what, at what point. I have a tendency to go on that spectrum of being discouraged much quicker than most people. And so I don't know about you, but I'm thinking for me, I'd probably give up hope. Oh, the justice is coming. Justice is coming. Maybe a month, maybe three, maybe, but eventually I'm going to kick in in my mind. It's going to be a battle of the flesh. Eventually I'm going to go, it's over. I might as well just resign and settle in and accommodate myself to this new life. It's not fair. It's not right. But this is my, I don't know at what point he gave up hope. But it was after 37 years. And I have to say 37 years is a long time to wait for anything. And yet, it was the king of Babylon that came to encourage him. And speak kindly to him. In the same way God lifts our heads. And gives us hope. We're forgiven and we're set free. Listen church, never underestimate the power of a kind word. Never underestimate the power of a kind text message or a kind email or even taking in the old school, and I still love to do this myself, just taking old school, sitting down with a pen and a card and jotting a note down, popping it in the mailbox and just knowing that it'll be delivered according to the timing of the Lord. Never underestimate that. If this culture and our world needs anything, it needs the kindness and the love and the grace flowing through us as believers. That, that's one of the greatest. Remember, Jesus said, as he looked at us today, and he says, there will be one mark among you that will distinguish you from the culture that you live in. He says, you'll know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. And with the technology we have today, just constantly so, I mean, think about this. The world needs more kind social media posts. I don't know if you've been watching social media, so man, it's just, We've lost our minds. So much so that I'm not even on Facebook anymore. Personally, I made that personal decision. I think it's been two, two and a half years. I have a program that posts for me. I, I still post on Facebook, but I never see anything because it just got too much, just soiled my soul. It was just bumming me out. Watching what believer, all the energy and effort. Because a lot of the people on my feet are people I know, people who go to a church with me, people that I serve, people that I pastor. And I'm just like, are you serious? This is the biggest issue in your life? And, and it's like social media has created in us, whether it's social engineered us into thinking that everybody wants our opinion. I don't want your opinion. Keep it to yourself. Tell me what the word of God says. Let me have your biblically informed opinion, but I'm not asking for your opinion. I'm asking you to point me to the Lord. That's what I need. Because I don't know about you, but I've noticed over the years that my opinion has changed dramatically. As I've gotten older, as my kids have gotten older, as life circumstances have happened. But one thing that hasn't changed along the way is God's word. And my opinion is shifting more and more, being conformed into the image of Christ kindness is needed jot it down psalm 3 verse 3 it says but you O lord are a shield for me my glory and the one that lifts up my head i cried to the lord with my voice and he heard me he was released number one comforted number two notice number three in verse 28 jehoiachin was immediately exalted by the king Verse 28 says, he spoke kindly to him and notice, gave him a more prominent seat than those of the kings who were with him in Babylon. He re immediately received prominence. He went from the prison to the palace immediately. More prominent than any of the other kings. Not only did the king of Babylon speak kindly after releasing him, but he also restored his life to what it had been before the enemy stole it away. I love that. God is in the business of restoration, building back up. Uh, one of the verses, because I didn't get saved till later in life myself, and I had done, ruined so much of my life and hurt so many people. One of the promises that God gave me was in the book of Joel, that God would restore to me the years that the locust has eaten. So I, it became this, this thing in my life where I was looking forward to the day 
uh, where I could celebrate with the church, make a big deal about it, yay, sing a special song, whatever, dance on the stage, whatever it was, that I served God one day longer than I served the world. Tragedy struck in my life, and so that day hit in a time of mourning and such, so we didn't get to do that, but it came nonetheless. So I can say now that I have served God far longer than I served him in the world. And I count all my baby years too because I was a rotten baby like from birth. I count all those years and I just kind of look at it all the way through that God is so gracious to me. He elevated me to a position that belongs to him. It's his position. It's not my position. I didn't earn it. I don't deserve it. I no more deserve it now having in February, I'll be walking with the Lord for 20, I think 29 years now. And I don't more deserve serving God today than the moment I walked into that church in Downey, California, as lost as lost could be, just dangling over the fires of hell with my life. He was exalted by the king. Overwhelmed today are you by resentment and bitterness, thinking maybe your life is over and it's impossible to rebound from the mess that you're in. Listen, not only does God forgive you, but he also restores to you. That's why forgiveness is so overwhelming. It's so beautiful. It's it's in and of itself, the act of forgiveness brings so much to our lives. Remember, not only does God forgive, but he restores. Some of you have memorized Psalm 23. Somebody just actually sent me this morning. I looked at it before I came in. Somebody sent me a note, and this is the power of a kind word. It's like total, total, total amazing God. Now that I'm thinking about it, about the verse I'm about to quote to you, they sent me a song by Phil Wickham singing a version of this verse in Psalm 23, verses one, two, all the way through. The Lord, if you know the psalm, say it with me. You ready? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Now, maybe you forget this next one. He restoreth my soul. That's the shepherd. He exalts and restores. One of the reasons why God has us to memorize scripture is so that we wouldn't sin against him. God, you want to restore me. You, you think today in, on, in this realm of forgiveness, I've lost so much, Ed. I know. And the good shepherd wants to bring a restoration into your life, an excitement. He wants you to be released from the anger and bitterness and frustration toward a person in many ways probably doesn't even care. But our Father in heaven, he cares for us. Not only that, number four, check this out. This is so good. Jehoiachin was then clothed by the king. Check this out in verse 29. So Jehoiachin changed from his prison garments and he ate bread regularly before the king. He changed his prison garments. You know, how can we not think of prison garments and not think of an orange jumpsuit? Like, okay, so Jehoiachin comes out 37 years in this orange jumpsuit. And as everything's happening around him, he needed to change his clothes because he's not in prison anymore. He had, listen, what, what, what forgiveness did for him gave him a different look. Now, you know, if you're, you know, I'm driving down different roads and it says, uh, it says there's a big sign, don't pick up hitchhikers because there's a prison nearby. Right, But nobody's going to pick up a hitchhiker hopping along in a handcuffs and an orange jumpsuit. Like, you know, like, oh, they need a ride, honey. No, no, pull over and call 911. They need to go back to prison. But when you, if that same person changed their clothes, well, it's different because you don't quite know where they came from. Now, of course, if there's a sign up there that says don't pick up hitchhikers, please follow the sign. However... As I said earlier, bitterness, unforgiveness, people wear it on their face. It actually ages you. You might be talking to someone and they tell you their age and you go, in your mind, you may not, you haven't, you guys realize by now you have an inside voice and an outside voice. Your inside voice says, wow, this person's aged. Has had a hard life. I I think of my own grandmother. Um, She's gone home to be with the Lord now, but... 
my grandmother looked far more old than she really was because indeed she had a very hard life until just the last few years of her life when she turned her life over to Jesus Christ and began to understand the grace of God. It, it almost like enlivened her countenance. But she had a hard life. Unforgiveness will lead to a hard life. You can't live life stuck all the time. Jehoiachin was clothed, released from prison, encouraged, given a prominent place, and now he's put on royal robes. To think of the great work of God in our lives. He restores our nature, restores our integrity, restores our character, restores our reputation, and he clothes us. It speaks of a further time of the coming of the Lord, Jesus Christ, robing us in those white marriage, with those robes, those white royal robes for the marriage feast of the Lamb. God wants to do an outward change in you as you receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ in your own life. He takes away, listen, he takes away the garment of sadness and gives us a garment of praise, Isaiah 61, three says. Garments and clothing are all throughout the scriptures, symbolically speaking, of where we are in life. Number five, we have just a couple more before we head out. Number five, Jehoiachin in verse 29 was then favored. He got special favorite treatment by the king. As it says at the end there, he ate bread regularly before the king all the days of his life. That that may not sound that big a deal, but he's sitting at the king's table. You remember in the early, you Bible students remember, we get insight to the king's table, especially the Babylonian king's table in the beginning part of Daniel. That's what Daniel and his friends had to resist. All the food and all the luxurious, everything that the king of Babylon had as the ruler of the world, this is what Jehoiachin now gets to enjoy. He's there every day before the king in relationship. The king did not abandon Jehoiachin. In fact, by his invitation to eat at his table, he wanted him to know that they would be friends forever. Because when God forgives us in Christ, he draws us into a forever relationship with him. He doesn't let it go of us. He, instead, he draws us and invites us into his presence. Even after failure after failure, through his word, invites us into praise and worship and into an eternal loving relationship. And as I mentioned in Revelation chapter 19, verse 9, it says, the angel said, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. These are true words that come from God. Yeah. Finally, number six, at the end, it says in verse 30 that Jehoiachin's future was secured. It says all of his provisions, there was a regular ration given him by the king, a portion for each day, and don't miss those words, all the days of his life. 37 years of prison, but now he'll be taken care of all the days. He had nothing to worry about. Forgiveness placed him in a a position of no more worry. No more anxiety as it relates to that situation. The king assured him that he'd be taken care of for the rest of his days. From prison to lifetime security. It's a picture of the amazing grace of God. Because God has secured our future as well. By Christ. Jesus has given us eternal joy and salvation. No one, nothing, the Bible says, can snatch us out of his hands. <laughs> nothing can separate us from the love of God. I'm grateful for that. Listen, this is amazing. The greatest gift in our lives that God has is to forgive us. There isn't anything other. We don't, we, if that's all that he ever gave us was the gift of forgiveness, we have it all. We've been taken out of prison. We've been elevated. We've been taken care of. We've been comforted. We've been clothed. Our whole eternal future is secure. Everything else is bonus. And how does it come? Through the forgiveness of God. So let me say this as as we close. Very important. Listen, because this is super key because some of you are on the edge of decision right now. And it's beautiful. But I want you to understand that a forgiveness that is not full is not true forgiveness. A forgiveness that is not full is not true forgiveness. When a person says something like this, well, I forgive you, but I'll never forgive. You guys can talk out loud, it's fine. You can talk to me, I can handle it. I'll try it again, you ready? 
I forgive you, but I'll... Oh, some of you have heard that before. Used that before. That's not real forgiveness. You go, Ed, but Ed, how can I ever forget? Listen, when you forgive, you're choosing not to hold it against the person. It's not that your mind will completely erase the pain. God has made our minds very powerful. And we have wonderful memories, although our memories are getting all messed up as we get older. I don't know about you, but I'm starting to remember things I don't want to remember at all. And then I can't even find my keys. And I've got one of those things that should beep. I have a beeper thing on my keys, and I can't even hear now with their, wherever the beeper is around the house. It's like, ha. Huh. But God has made our memories very strong, and they have indelible imprints, especially deep hurts. Forgiveness is not necessarily your mind's going to be wiped. Forgiveness means you choose not to hold it against them. You can't come alongside and go, okay, I'm with you, but I'll bury the hatchet, but I'm going to leave the handle showing so I can find it when I need it. No, when we bury something, we let it go. As far as the east is from the west, so far God has removed our sins from us. He chooses not to hold them. How can an omniscient, all-knowing God forget our sins? he simply chooses not to hold them against us he sees us now through the filter of the blood of Jesus Christ that our safest most powerful place on the planet earth is to be found hidden in Christ by faith and so when he sees us he sees the forgiveness that a layer of forgiveness that has been given to us and he releases us from the debt that we owe him And there's a problem that man has often with forgiveness that it's not true because we create God in our own image And we don't just have the proper concept. When we think of God in our own image, then we think of temporary or partial forgiveness. And we don't have a true concept of the fullness of forgiveness that comes from God. We accept it. We don't fully value it. Because when God forgives you of your sin, it's a total, complete forgiveness. Never to be held against you again. Never. Even if you look in the mirror and hold it against yourself, that is not from God. Because he's forgiven you through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross. Never again will you have to answer to God for the sin that has been placed under the blood of Jesus Christ. He has forgiven. And it's tragic in our relationships with others that our forgiveness is such that we're prone to bring it up again in the future. This is a marriage issue, a huge marriage issue. That God is, you just keep bringing up the past instead of resolving the past. You, you are bringing it up. We're prone to throw up a past to a person. Yeah, but you did that. Yeah, but you, but I asked you to forgive me and you forgave me. And then the answer, yeah, I forgave you, but I'll never forget. And you just at a standstill. No, true forgiveness is forgiving and letting the past be the past. I know Marie and I, as we, we've been through a lot, both we got married as a believer, an unbeliever, and we got saved later on, and we had a lot of history and a lot of pain that I caused that young girl from a young age. Um, we were boyfriend and girlfriend in high school. We have a lot of past, let's just put it that way. We have a lot of past. And God has brought us to a place where God, he's now using the past that's been redeemed as a testimony of the power of God, not to destroy each other. Because Marie, if I went home today, she's at home. If I went home today, you can pray for her, by the way. She's recovering right now. She had some procedure done, so she's at home resting. But otherwise, she'd be with me today. <clears throat> but if she wanted to, if I got walked home, if I got right in the door, she could be standing at the door. Ed, do you remember what you did to me back in 1985? I go, yeah, I do. I was such an idiot in 1985. And I think I've said sorry a thousand times. I mean, she could change the whole dynamic of the home. She could probably bring out a book and give me dates and times and hours of things that I did to hurt her, her mom, anyone that she loved. But because of the finished work of the cross in Jesus Christ, Marie and I don't talk about our past like that. But rather, if we have the chance, as we do on occasion, to talk as a married couple to other couples at a conference, at a breakfast, whatever we're... We get to take our past and give it with the perspective of the finished work of Christ in our lives. So that, you know, for for a teenage mom, one of the things that I did, uh, one of the things that I did to harm her in 1985 is I got her pregnant. She was just a teenager. 
I was a teenager too, but she was younger than me. And we ended up getting together and not getting together, breaking up and all of that. But just this year, by the grace of God, we celebrated 30 years of marriage. <laughs> Only God can do that. 30 years of marriage. And, and we raised that young boy. And we had two other children. And now serving him in the ministry. See, the perspective is everything. And you want to start looking at life and the situations in your life through the lens of the forgiveness of God. Because it changes everything. Just me thinking right now, just on the platform, I didn't plan on it, it's not in my notes, but just thinking about back to those days, I have visual, I have visual remembrances of the faces of the people that I hurt. And even after becoming a believer, I started looking for people that I hurt and extending, asking forgiveness. Some people received it. Some people said they'll never forgive me the rest of my life. And I just don't know the forgiveness of God yet. And that's why I pray for their salvation. I pray that God would do a work, that he would, yeah, man, if I could, isn't it true with what we know today, if we went back with what we know today, we wouldn't make the same decisions, of course. I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of a free thing to know that if I just forgive. And in part of the Bible study that I shared with you in that series is you got to learn how to forgive yourself. Don't think of that the way the world does. I'm no way using the way the world uses it. The biblical definition of forgiving yourself is trusting God and believing him that through the blood of Jesus Christ you have been forgiven. You've got to learn to accept the forgiveness of God for yourself because that's a double freedom. That the Lord would do a great work and has done a great work because God's forgiveness is complete. As a believer, you've been justified. You haven't just been declared innocent or forgiven. You've been declared so innocent, it's as though you never committed it to begin with. The slate is wiped clean. And that's the message that the Lord has sent me here today. To encourage forgiveness. Receiving, giving, living. Amen? Father, thank you for the privilege of being here today. For the work of your Holy Spirit among us. I know it's a challenge and a difficulty as we think through the issues in our own lives. I know there's probably a little bit of resistance, maybe somebody watching online and just kind of resistant, um, not wanting to receive the fullness of this freeing truth in your word, but I pray that you break down the barriers, that there would be those here today that would turn away from their sin and acknowledge you as their savior. But for all of us, Lord, you know, I think of some things in my own life, even now that I walked in this room with, that I woke up with. Life is not perfect and it's not all lined up right and not every situation is fixed or healed, not every relationship. We have family issues. Uh, maybe a pastor's hurt us or a church has hurt us or whatever. We've hurt ourselves. We're just wounded, broken people, Lord, that want the wholeness that is promised to us by your spirit. So we, I just release that sense of wholeness that's ours by faith among us today and that we would walk in the fullness of forgiveness growing day by day in Jesus name. Amen.